That dorky white guy dancing right there, that's me. And this is my church. Like many other members of Generation X, I find my spirituality nourished far away from the mainline institutions of religion. And this documentary is an attempt to take you into this world and to show you why, for many people, this is their spiritual community. Since I will be your guide on this journey and you will experience this phenomenon through my eyes, we will begin with an introduction. As my Little League baseball card says, my name is Jeremy Nichol. In 1976, I was born in a small suburb of Boston, Mass, called Newton. It was a very sheltered and privileged place to grow up, but it was also close enough to a major metropolitan area that we were aware of the larger world around us. And of course, there was the Boston Red Sox. I was baptized into that cult in 1986, when I invited my entire Little League team over for Game 6 of the World Series. What ensued was 18 years of unrequited faith, part of 86 years of baseball misery that miraculously came to an end this fall. I have very vivid memories of an inner relationship with God from a young age. My favorite spot to continue this dialogue with what at the time I only knew as the not me was under a tree by the shores of a lake near my house. I never thought of calling my conversation partner God until many years later. And still to this day, that term makes me uncomfortable. But nonetheless, from a young age, I would converse regularly with that inner voice that was not mine. Also, about three Sundays a month, my family would attend the local Unitarian Church. I have generally very fond memories of these times. It was a liberal and nurturing community to learn the basics about religion from. Another major spiritual influence on my life was the time I spent living and traveling in Nepal. I spent months living with a Tibetan Buddhist family, just down the street from one of the most holy stupas in Buddhism. But I also spent a month hiking and motorcycling through the Himalayas, visiting holy sites. The monks, sadhus, and other religious ascetics that I encountered during this journey exposed me to stories and ideas that I had never even imagined existed. It was not, however, within this context that I would have my first powerful bodily experience of worship. In the early 90s, I began attending live music events. On the East Coast, Fish was just beginning to announce themselves as the inheritors of the great 60s tradition of jam-based, ever-evolving music events. Between Fish, the waning career of the Grateful Dead, and the dozens of festivals and bands that exploded onto the scene at this time, I was able to tap into a phenomenon already familiar to a generation. I have spent many evenings, weekends, and summers since attending shows in small cafes and clubs, giant concert halls and stadiums, and entire fairgrounds when lucky. I never said out loud that what I was having was a religious experience. But if someone had said that at the time, I have no doubt that myself and many others would have agreed. When the house lights went out and the show began, I would start moving my feet, arms, and slowly my entire body. I would feel myself gradually slipping away, giving myself up to the music. My eyes would meet those of others feeling it, and the bond was communicated instantly and wordlessly. They played, 
we danced, and it was simply perfect. Years later, I find myself in seminary, and more aware of the importance of live music to my spirituality than ever. And with that, we come full circle back to this documentary. Finally, I have found the authority to explore what I have suspected for so long. My claim is twofold. First, that live music events do indeed act as a spiritual community for many. And second, that once we understand this phenomenon, we can better channel the powerful, positive energy generated by these events for the betterment of humankind. I believe that the mainstream distrust and misunderstanding of the live music community is one of the main factors preventing it from being a more positive source of change. To begin to more fully understand this community, we must first put it in its proper context. Musical religious communities didn't magically spring out of the Kool-Aid in the 1960s. Its roots are much deeper. In fact, our story begins long ago in Africa. Although there are many fine examples of West African cultures where musico-religious communities existed, the Yoruba are the most important to our story due to their specific influence during the time of the slave trade. The Yoruba are from modern-day Nigeria and were organized into that country by European force around the year 1500 of the Common Era, and their culture is believed to have existed for many centuries before their so-called discovery by Portuguese slave hunters. This Yoruban ritual, recorded by Margaret and Henry Drewall, shows many features traceable to our modern American musico-religious communities. Practices change from ritual to ritual, but the Yoruban rituals generally included the use of heavy percussion, group dance, possession, and above all, improvisation. As communities of slaves formed in the West Indies and Americas, there was a constant need for vast communities of highly diverse populations to be assimilated quickly. As Wynton Marcellus points out in Ken Burns' documentary on jazz, ability to improvise was key, and music was one of the few immediate points of contact for the men and women far away from home. The slave masters understood the power of music, so of course they immediately banned it. There was one place in the entire early South where slaves were allowed to play their drums, Congo Square, in a city called New Orleans. Once a week, they were allowed to gather in Congo Square and play their drums, but they still were not allowed to pray to their gods. This created a situation where the musico-religious possession practices crossed over to a secular musical entertainment context, while still retaining its core practices and sensibilities. This musical collaboration shaped the musical concepts all of present-day American music is based upon, and in the immediacy, it gave birth to jazz and blues. Rock and roll is the most obvious example of current music that springs directly out of this tradition. In his groundbreaking book on musico-religious communities, religion scholar Robin Sylvan relates the following quotation from cultural historian Michael Ventura. It preserves qualities of that African metaphysic intact so strongly that it unconsciously generates the same dances, acts as a major antidote to the mind-body split, and uses a derivative of techniques of possessions as a source for performers and audiences alike of tremendous personal energy. So out of this tradition, we got Elvis, Jerry Lee Lewis, The Beatles, and so many other great bands. And this music, not so coincidentally, occurs simultaneously within the larger context of the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s. It is simply impossible to divorce this enormous shift in human consciousness from the music that accompanied it. And after the 1960s, rock and roll itself began to split into several different subgenres. Among them, punk rock, heavy metal, jam bands, and later hip hop. The subgenre that I am most familiar with is the jam band school, and so we will use jam bands for the vast majority of the case studies in this documentary. Jam bands, like any genre, are impossible to precisely define, but it is almost universally accepted that their essential characteristic is their reliance on improvisation. That is to say, the jam bands can be comprised of an almost endless arrangement of instruments, and can base their songs in many different traditions. 
so long as they improvise substantially throughout their live performances. Beyond improvisation, there are a lot of different understandings of what a jam band is. To create this documentary, I talked to a lot of different people, from band members to fans to concert promoters and music scholars, and I got a taste of the broad understanding of this term when I asked them to define it. The term jam band, I think, will we say it describes the fan um, of the music more so than the band itself, because the bands span a multitude of genres. You know, if I were to put like a sign, like a specific like term that would be identified with jam, I think it would be like improv um, or improvisation. If it refers to a set of gigs, basically. Like, if you gig in, at these clubs or at these festivals, then you're a jam band. These four claims about jam bands represent a non-exhaustive list of characteristics that people expect from this genre of music. Other characteristics include sonic driving, guitar noodling, and polyrhythmic layering. And now that we have a basic understanding of jam bands, we can begin to dig deeper into this phenomenon. There is a radical shift happening right now in religion, as the old institutions, mired in scandal, hypocrisy, and old age, are beginning to lose relevance. This emergent spiritual movement is changing beliefs, language, and worship practices, and is widespread and organic. One of the main features of this new spirituality is the fact that it is grounded in personal experience, yet seemingly paradoxically it is at its core a form of universalism. I study this phenomenon as it presently exists within the context of live music events, yet I have no doubt that it can be found in many other venues as well. That being said, as I laid out in the last chapter, live music has a long history of being a particularly effective technology for facilitating direct personal experience of the divine. And, and so those songs really became a form of prayer for me. Um, and it's interesting because it's, it's like, there's that state that, you, that I enter into when I'm writing the song, and then I'm trying to bring it through and, and, and use sort of my left brain stuff to sort of codify it. Um, but the interesting thing is that I can always tap back into that state by playing the song, and I realize that this is a kind of a technology where you can almost take a snapshot of that experience, and then that becomes a doorway or an entry point to, sorry, to go back into it. In this chapter, through interviews with a wide variety of people, I will describe this emergent spirituality and explain the factors that help shape it. This neo-universalism is a direct response to the combination of the renewed spiritual importance that the last few generations have placed on personal experience and the explosion of possibilities for direct experience with a plethora of different religious traditions and practices. unprecedented number of people can safely explore and learn about different traditions, picking and choosing aspects that speak to them. Implicit within this is the acknowledgement that different paths are necessary for different people. This is one way in which this phenomenon is a radical form of universalism. You know, if you go back over the last several thousand years, I think that typically people were born into a certain culture and that culture had it's religion, singular, you know, one religion, and you were born in that, and you were raised in that, and you lived within that, and you died within that, and it's very rare that you would have exposure to anything else. And that historical situation is ancient history. I mean, it's just, it's impossible to grow up now in complete isolation from other religions and spiritual systems. And so what you find then is this process that you're referring to of people, you know, uh, we'll use the word from um, Levi Strauss, you know, bricolage, everyone's being a bricoleur, they're stitching together, they're cobbling together a path from a whole variety of disparate sources, you know. And, and, and I'm creating my own 
So for example, from every religion that there is in the world, you can take a little bit that you like that resonates with you. So for example, I really like that idea of not doing anything on Saturday. So I took that from, I think that's Judaism. They're all telling parts of the same story. They've divided themselves in a way that it's kind of, I mean, to, it seems like to the consciousness of, of kids today and, and what we understand, it seems kind of ridiculous to us all. That, it, that these beliefs and people holding these high ideals can be so, so violent to, to protect their beliefs. And I don't, it's not what I believe. Organized religion is just a vehicle to get there. And just like some people like jam bands and some people like heavy metal, you gotta find your way to get there. It's not that Buddhism is correct or Catholicism is correct, but that's just the way that you get there. And everyone has their own way. I think that um, it's like the coming together of the tribes. It, the, the, new, the new religion is no religion. It's just the, it's just the meat of what all the religions have been saying all along anyway. The other main factor this new phenomenon is responding to is the perceived hypocrisy of old mainline institutions. Whether because of faith-related violence, abuse of power, or any of their many other recent public failings, people are simply not willing to listen to rules and judgments from a morally bankrupt source. I found like in, like in organized religions, you're judged. If we come to these festivals, you're not judged. You're just here. You just, you just hang loose and do your thing. And that's how our church should be. Like I say, church as the ideal is great. Because, you know, as being black and doing the civil rights movement, the church was a very strong part of that because that's what we meant and all that. And the principle of church is great. I loved it. But the message now, you know, is like, you act this way, act this way, or you going to hell, that ain't cool. And here, you don't do that. It's not here. You just be yourself, chill, have a good time. Besides not going to institutional worship services, people often express this by defining themselves as spiritual rather than as religious. So I, I, I think where I've evolved to in myself is I, I use this word spirit, which to me, and I'm not saying to everyone, but to me has um, less of that baggage and less of those connotations. I'm, re I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious because to me, religion is like structured. And there's like guidelines and just stupid little rituals that I don't believe in. And just people judge it. My biggest thing about religion is that people are like judge a lot of people. People want to, when they say that, they want to make it clear that they're not a religious fanatic and follow an organized religion, so to speak. Uh, spirituality is your individual relationship with the divine and I should speak for myself, my individual relationship with the divine and however that manifests itself for people. Uh, you know, for me, music is a very, very spiritual. That I'm, I'm much more spiritual than religious. What is the difference between those two words? Religious means do this, do that, bow. It's a man-made substance. Where spirituality is a feeling in your heart of the warmth that life gives you. you know? um, I mean, all I did in church was sit there and go, wow, I just, I know there's more than this. <laughs> you know, um, and for sure, you know, instead of this rigid, non-yielding, silent, threatening stuff, you've got this sweet, kind family that, you know, if I fell in the floor, if I hurt myself, I think I would have people come over and help me. Although this phenomenon is coming on the backs of our old traditions, some pieces of the old tradition are not welcome in the new formulation. 
like the rejection of the term religious for the term spiritual, all exclusive, non-universal language is out, especially when it comes to descriptions of the divine. I heard over and over again people explicitly rejecting the old male god who judges from on high, and instead describing God with metaphors about energy and relationality. I, I think part of all that difficulty in there has to do with that you know, God in our culture has become identified with this kind of monotheistic, you know, gray-haired, bearded old man in the sky who sort of controls everything, but who you actually never really have any contact with. But I just, I've always had the impression from religions and growing up that like, God is this guy in this throne, like, and you did this wrong, and you did that wrong, and I hated it. I felt like, you know, I had to like pray every day or like going to hell. You know, everyone's got a different name for God, but really to me what it means, it's not like a man in a physical form, it's more of like a spiritual universe. So I could be speaking to you and your God, the trees could be God, and in a sense, like if, if you're trying to find this connection of spirituality and of a higher power, to me nature is God. And if, if you see God in every living thing, and if everyone thought that way, I really truly believe that we would live more compassionately. For me is, is the sum of the collective conscious. Um, God is, is the spark that got it all going. We are God. <laughs> we, we, we are, every living creature, every living thing is all part of it. And you can call it God if you want to. Some people call Allah the greater power, the, the spiritual energy. It's, it's all here. It's all happening. From hearing the descriptions of God that people offered, I realized that this neo-universalism includes a process metaphysics. This makes sense, as process thought is all about relationality and community. What process says is that God is somehow dynamically involved. Right? So there's, there's an attempt conceptually to make sense of God loves. That's profound. I think that's very, very important for younger people. To, who, who want to be able to think about God in profoundly relational terms and are okay suspending a classical conception of God as, as uh, essentially emotionally stoic. An area where this becomes very obvious is when people discuss the way that a live audience affects the direction of improvised music. The understanding of the connections between the different participants in creating an event and the importance people placed on this was defining of a process metaphysic. I, I think with these type of bands, there is this tremendous sense of familiarity um, and knowledge that the audience has. In other words, um, they're not casual listeners. They know all the songs. They know all the lyrics to all the songs. They know all the guitar riffs and the changes. And so there's this whole world of associations there when you see those band members up on stage and they're playing, you can tell the nuances of how they're playing it the same or how they're playing it differently. And there's, and so, you know, if there's a shift that happens, there's an no audible ripple that can happen in the audience. People understand that you're taking it in another direction now, and that has a whole world of meanings and associations with it. It's a symbiotic relationship. Uh, it's, uh, the band feeds off the energy of the crowd. Well, the crowd feeds off the energy of the band, which in turn feeds back to the band. And if everyone's really paying attention and everyone's really dialed in, great, incredible things will happen. That it works perfectly with the, with the jam bands because in that sort of in that space of improvisational creativity you've got to be on point you've got to be listening you have to be aware of what's going on around you with your fellow musicians and that's what you know breeds some of the greatest bands of all time is just the ability to communicate without communicating and at the same time if that 
communication between band members can extend out into the crowd, then you can then you're just working together the whole time, and you know it's a collaborative effort to have a great time. You know we're a very improvised band, as I keep saying, and in that kind of situation, the the quality and intensity and vibration of the audience's attention is really what's conducting us. You know we're like an orchestra at the hand of a conductor, and the conductor is the audience's attention. We basically surf on that wave, you know what I'm saying? Like whatever the audience is doing emotionally and psychologically and spiritually while we're on stage immediately becomes what we're playing. So it's a very like in the moment transfer of, of energy and ideas. It happens in the air between myself as a player and the audience as whatever, however you want to you say them. The reality of what you do hangs in the air between, okay, it's not yours, it's not theirs, it's ours, and it hangs in the air in between. And when that happens, I disappear, they disappear, and an event takes place, and then you've got something. Being a neo-universalism, the worship practice is mainly concerned with transcending the personal level of consciousness through attaining states of altered consciousness. This state is attained in many different ways and means different things to different people. The common thread is the acknowledgement that the ego is in opposition to personal experience of the divine and to living in the moment. You know, we have this I, the ego, um, which sort of has hegemony over the rest of the psyche. So how, how do you transcend that? And I think music is one of the key ways for doing that, that the experiential state that we get into with music is in many cases so powerful that um, it temporarily restructures the ego. And what that means is that the, the ego can kind of temporarily step aside and I don't necessarily mean consciously step aside, I just mean that you're swept away, you know? You're swept away in the flow, or you're swept away in the jam, or you're swept away on the dance floor, or you're swept away. This is a word that comes, or a lot of times interviews people would say, I would lose myself, I would lose my sense of myself. This is, this is also language describing the same process. It's almost, it's almost that it's divine and it's coming through them and the players are really a channel for the music coming through and whatever is influencing that channel and affecting uh, affecting that and some of that can be the music when it comes out and comes back around and through. Uh, I've heard a lot of players say that when they're, and just a lot of people, whenever you're in the zone in doing something, you're just this open vessel and inspiration is coming through you and you almost can't really control it. You can feel it and you can guide it, but you can't really control it. You just have to ride it, you have to be in it. It's really purely about music and at that moment. I love the people too that just dance and go crazy and it doesn't matter what they look like, but they're feeling it. That, that is what it's about. It's surrendering to the moment. And it's, it's an escape from my head. It's a physical, it's a physical kinesthetic experience. An escape from, you know, being inside my head, which happens all too often and it's really about connecting people to themselves in a certain way through music and uh, it's, a, it's a process of letting go of certain aspects of thinking of yourself or thinking thoughts in your mind and just being in the moment but at the same time being in the moment sharing that moment with lots of other people so you, you enter a field of, of energy that you're sharing with people which is very powerful. Some people also utilize drugs to attain this state, but others rely on one of many other practices, ranging from dance, chanting, meditation, and movement exercises like yoga. So let's establish both those points. One, yes, psychoactive plants are traditionally used in a lot of religions, but two, um, they are certainly not necessary within the context of using music and dance and rhythm as an extraordinarily powerful medium for producing altered states of consciousness and contacting the spiritual world. Um, so both those things are true. When it comes to the specific 
musical, popular music scenes that we're talking about, I, I mean, there's no way to avoid that, that drugs are widely used. Does that mean that it's all dependent on drugs and that it's all about drug use? Absolutely not. I don't know if drugs are a part of, or are essential to the experience. I think whatever can open a person's mind is essential to being part of the scene. I have friends who have incredibly open minds who've never done any drugs in their lives. Um, you know, drugs have opened many doors in many minds over time uh, for an awful lot of people. But I can appreciate how people would want to use drugs and I know people who do use drugs when they're at these events to take them to another level and make it a totally unearthly experience for them and it just helps them to get outside of themselves and experience life in an indescribable way. But I don't feel that I need that. I'm, I'm pretty much high on just the music itself. I'm amazed at what is legal and what isn't legal. And then I start to think about why certain things aren't legal and, and what is it about them that's not, that shouldn't be legal. And then you start to think about you know, the connections and the, and the, and the business behind them and, and maybe the, the mental thoughts that people are having while doing them. That, uh, so this thing, coffee, that makes you do dumb things faster is legal. But smoking, which relaxes you and actually makes you think about how we should be more united in our causes together as a people and under one love, Bob Marley, Ja Love, it's not, it's not, we're not allowed to do that. So, so I break it down to the non-sacramental use being a bad thing only because it is done without regard for the, tr the awesome power. And quite frankly, you, you can go to the Oracle as many times as you want, but if you don't start asking new questions, you're not going to get any new answers. And those people who do use these substances quite respectfully and use them to open themselves up to others and the world. We are right now witnessing the infancy of this new movement beyond denominational categories and towards a universal faith that is defined by radical inclusivity rather than strict codes and hierarchical structures. Um, you know, I, I see that in, in the rave scene. I think there's a model there. I don't know if it's a, a replicatable model, you know, but there's a model for um, this post-denominational spirituality where you can kind of put aside um, what your differences are and, uh, you know, um, emphasize the unity aspect of that rather than what, what defines us. My long-term vision is to create a sacred space that can facilitate a community of people that can come together and begin making this shift explicit. Worship will be based around live music experience and include all kinds of performance and art, but it will also enable this community to take their faith to a new level by linking them to social justice organizations and connecting them to smaller communities that they can stay in connection with in their everyday life.